Hi, I'm Debbie Moraes. Once again, this is Legal Matters, the program that's been designed to address the critical, timely, sometimes contentious issues that are facing consumers and businesses. It's legal information, practical solutions, and straight talk about a wide variety of issues that affect your work and home life. The big news undoubtedly recently has been Hurricane Irene, death and destruction wrought by a big storm, and it's left millions without power, billions more it'll cost to fix it. Um, locally, we've had our issues, certainly, and complaints, some that were minor with inconveniences, others with serious losses. And while many are, who are affected by the storm look to state and federal government, more are hoping that their insurance companies will step in and help foot the bill. And some of those people, of course, are going to be in for a rude awakening or a little bit of a surprise. And as we know, many aren't covered or aren't covered completely for their damages and have to look elsewhere. So while it's time for us to clean up, tally, point the fingers of blame, who's responsible, who pays, how much, we thought it would be a good time to have take advantage of that opportunity and help you solve and resolve some of the issues. We have always our legal counsel and once this time we have with us um, an insurance professional. So let's get going. We first want to welcome once again our lawyers, uh, Jackie Grasso and David G Bizarre from Audette Bizarre Cadero Grasso Law Firm in East Providence. And with us for the first time is Greg Troy from Troy Pyers Allen Insurance in Romford or East Providence. East Providence yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Let's go to you first. Media reports that the two most frequently asked questions or problems are about fallen trees and spoiled foods, who's responsible, what's covered. We're going to have you give us some information and then help hopefully have Jackie and David fill in the rest of the story. Greg, what's the story? What's yeah, been going on? Well, this, this storm, uh, the big issues were trees, of course, coming down. And uh, trees, of course, they're either your tree that falls down or your neighbor's tree that falls on your property. Either way, your insurance policy responds. Uh, hopefully, it responds. There are different policies have different coverages. But uh, you would look at to your company. The other big question we were getting, because it took people up to a week to get back uh, up running, was food spoilage. Uh, your standard policy doesn't cover food spoilage for the most part, but there are, are a lot of carriers that had enhancements that were picking up. Uh, up to two fifty, five hundred dollars worth of coverage for you. When someone has an issue with the wind or the flood damage, what is it that they do? Presumably, they call you first. Uh, presumably, you folks second. But if you first, what do you do when someone calls? What's the processing that they need to go through? Well, when it's a major storm like this, the insurance companies prepare themselves by getting additional people working, eight hundred numbers and such. So the consumer has the option of giving the agent a call. We take the information and, and fax it or phone it into the carrier, or the consumer is able to call directly to the company and get something set up. Of course, the, the timing is going to be the issue. So many claims, you can only have so many hands on deck doing as much as you can. So now after the storm, patience is going to be a real virtue at this point. I guess if the wind and the rains might have died down a little bit, still temper frustrations high and tempers are still flaring, and I think that's probably where one of the places where you and and David come in. What what have you been receiving? Have you been receiving phone calls and had problems yet? I, I, I've received a couple of phone calls about um, the legalities of fallen trees. If your, your neighbor's tree falls, who's responsible? My neighbor says, um, this person's neighbor said they weren't responsible because it fell on your property. So I went back and I did some research on that and um, Mr. Tro uh, Troy Troy, yeah, was, was correct. And if somebody's tree falls on your property, uh, you're responsible as the landowner, you, the neighbor, okay? If, unless you can prove that the person who has the tree on their property was under some, uh, had a tree that was dying, or you as the neighbor had put them on notice that they were um, hanging limbs and it looked like it was going to die, it looked like it was going to fall down. So uh, my research, there's some case law out there that says if it falls on your property, or if my tree falls on your property, you have to pick it up. Correct? Correct. Yeah, and... Um, Unless I was negligent. Some of the other calls is mm -hmm. there were some trees that fell on power lines. And the power company has to remove the tree from the line before you can even work on that situation. Well. And the towns, too. And the the issue about the towns, the right. trees falling in the street. I understand that documentation is 
very important, and I guess people do run around with their digital cameras, but um, from the time that a neighbor says, I think that tree, Harry, is about to fall, we haven't had the storm yet, but you better take care of it, I'm supposed to be documenting when yeah. I called, what it looked like beforehand. Oh, I Take hope some I photos. did. Photos. Did do people do that? I, you know, people don't think about that Although until in a storm world, happens. There are you some know? people out there, I bet, who do. Well, with we their do live in a litigious society. Uh, uh, there was a case back in the '70s called Rosa versus Oliveira, and that was an issue about a boundary dispute, and it all started because Mr. Oliveira. Um, neighbor who was Mr. Rosa, he cut down a lilac bush. And the lilac bush was on um, Mr. Rosa's property. So it was all over a boundary line. And then uh, that's really one of the most important cases when it comes to boundary lines. And that's where we go back to whose tree is it and who's responsible. Did, did that person have the right to cut down a, a lilac bush, um, even though part of it was on the other, uh, his neighbor's property? And, and the answer is yes. Okay. The answer is yes. When we've had that question asked to us prior to the mm -hmm. storm, and r really we have to tell people they should go to the city or town. They mu they have an arborist mm -hmm. that can go out and give their opinion as to whether or not the tree mm -hmm. is of a condition where it needs to be addressed, and then they can address the your neighbor, the property owner. I mean, we as you, we can't always pick our neighbors, so it's it's kind of hard for someone to go to someone that you don't otherwise have a good enough relationship with. To say, hey, you got to cut your tree down. Then, of course, there's an expense involved, yeah, you and uh, you know, it's it's not unusual for it to be a thousand dollars or so to take a tree down. And of course, it depends how big it is and mm -hmm. and uh, such. So it's it's a very difficult thing. But uh, getting as much documentation as you can is good. But it, I think it, in these matters, it's more important that you have somebody who is an expert, like the town arborist, to come and give their opinion and put the other person on notice. Now you're creating the liability so that their insurance policy could potentially uh, offer some type of coverage. Would it help if um, the arborist uh, puts it in writing? Oh, clearly. Okay. What happens if you ask the arborist to look at the tree subsequent to the storm? Is there a way that they can... Uh, tell that uh, the tree was going to fall regardless? You, you know, they may be able to, but even that, you don't know if that actually creates negligence. Yeah. You know, for the insurance policy, for your neighbor's insurance policy to respond under their liability, mm -hmm. you need negligence. So there could be a completely diseased tree or a rotted tree, but it looks healthy and happy from the outside. Mm -hmm internally is uh, you don't know until the tree actually fell down so there's still that question is there negligence at that point let's get back to that tree and that insurance policy I'm a homeowner and there are times <coughs> when the tree um, by itself could have fallen and hit something that now causes me some added expense you're covering that versus what happens the wind uprooted the tree, which then hit the roof, which then crashed the roof and crashed through the roof, and what are you covering, what aren't you covering? Yeah, the insurance policy is going to cover any damage that the tree does to your property, whether it lands on your garage, swimming pool, the house itself, roof, etc. It will not cover damage if it lands on your car or your neighbor's car. Automobiles are excluded from your house policy. You have to go to your car insurance policy to get that covered which is of course going to be an additional expense because you're now going to have a car insurance deductible as opposed to the house insurance deductible and obviously more frustration. But uh, getting back to the, you know, the damage to the house and such, that would uh, all be covered. Shingles that come down, water gets inside, et cetera. Now, does the deductible change based on whether or not this was storm-related, hurricane-related, uh, wind-related? Um, I have a standard deductible of five hundred. Yeah, most most people have happens. have deductibles of five hundred thousand dollars on their property. Some people even have higher. But Rhode Island does allow homeowners and uh, actually all uh, covering property to have a hurricane deductible. This is a special deductible that gets instituted if there is a hurricane, and I can get to that in a second. That deductible is anywhere from two, three, I've seen it as high as 5% of your coverage limit. So in Rhode Island, correct? In, in Rhode Island, okay. but it, it is in other states also. So if you have, for example, a $400,000 house, and you have a 2% hurricane deductible, 
that would mean damage that you incur from the hurricane would be subject to an $8,000 deductible, 2% of 400000 Now, some portions of your policy, such as food spoilage, and there are certain enhancements that have separate deductibles, but basically the damage to the structure itself would be subject to that deductible. So it was beneficial to the homeowners that this was not a hurricane, that it was downgraded. Clearly to beneficial, storm. yes. The so department then you don't have that deductible. Right. Thing. The Department of Business Regulation made the decision that uh, although portions of the state were under hurricane warning, we did not have the sustained hurricane winds, 74 miles an hour, and therefore no company was allowed to institute a hurricane deductible mm -hmm. in that regard. Har the um, devil's always in the details. Whose responsibility is it to make sure that said homeowner understands the nuances of what those triggers are or aren't and when it's covered and when it's not? Is that something that I, as the average homeowner, I'm supposed to read carefully every bit of fine print, or is that something that is in your court to make sure I understand it before well, I sign on a dotted line? We know, or of else course, we're going to call these folks. Yeah, we know, of course, everybody spends time reading their insurance policies yes. They're very daily. Exciting. They're All exciting, you know. Of it, yeah. yeah, I'm sure it's right next to uh, Time magazine. Yeah. Um, hopefully, you've been explained that when you purchase it. Uh, every policy has it uh, written, and it's pretty clearly defined on your de declaration page, but that doesn't mean you see it, understand it, or remember that you have it. So, you know, now since we didn't have that, this is probably the best time for you to take out your policy, look at it and say, okay, what would have happened if? Mm -hmm. And if you have questions, call your agent, call the company that you bought the policy from, and ask for an explanation. You know, that's what they're there for, and this is the best time to you know, fortunately, it didn't get uh, enacted, so let's find out now what would have happened if it had. What's the standard in Rhode Island for, let's talk about some other natural um, disasters, earthquake, for instance. Mm. What kind of coverage do we have in Rhode Island or exclusions? The standard homeowner policy, and actually the most standard business policies also, are not going to cover earthquake. You have to add that as an endorsement to the policy. Uh, it's not that expensive. I, I had coverage, yeah. earthquake coverage, yeah. a few years ago. Yeah, it's generally it's, it's relatively inexpensive. Yeah, it's it's probably in the range of about forty cents per thousand. Yeah, so a four hundred thousand dollar house, about one hundred sixty dollars a year to add it to your policy. Mm -hmm. But it's going to come with probably a five percent deductible. Mm -hmm. So uh, on your $400,000 house, you'd have a $20,000 deductible. We got a few phone calls on that last week or the week before when we actually uh, had that right. minor earthquake, well, minor for this area, mm -hmm. you know, more major down in Virginia, uh, hit the area. But uh, you're not going to have coverage under that policy unless you ask for it. I had one other question, if I might. Um, this storm was primarily wind. Yes. And it, if it was on the other side, I guess it would have been more rain and water. Mm. What type of coverages do you have to have to be protected if it was a water damage that you suffered? Water um, is covered under the policy. But basically, as I explained to people, water that comes from the ground into your house is not going to be covered under a standard policy. Water that comes from up above into your house probably will be covered because it got in there by either driven by rain underneath your shingles or uh, a tree caused damage where the rain got in. Uh, your standard policy is not going to cover it if you just leave a window open and the rain comes in. Uh, some coverage you'll get for that, some you won't. Uh, but generally speaking, had we got hit by the heavy rains, most of the damages would have been covered. Flooding is a whole different story, as we've known in Rhode Island over the past years, mm -hmm. the effects in Cranston, et cetera. Uh, automobiles that get affected by the water, they're covered, but if a flood is created, that is specifically excluded under a homeowner policy, and you need to purchase a separate flood policy. There are certainly uh, nuances and complexities, and of course people who are still uh, battling with could have uh, Hurricane Katrina mm. are still dealing with this. Now, the Weather Service ends up telling us that something's coming up the coast. So we have some plans and some time to prepare, and maybe I'm going to take in my lawn furniture, but when it comes to my coverage, uh, how much time do I have 
in anticipation of a storm to get to you to either review and or upgrade or initiate a new part of a policy to make sure that I don't end up with trouble? Well, you can always review it. You might not like the answers, uh, but you can always review it. Uh, as far as changing, generally insurance companies in the range to 48 hours prior to an occurrence uh, hitting the area will uh, stop allowing you to make changes in your policies, and that would include uh, lowering your deductibles or increasing your coverages or adding something to your policy. Some people uh, took comprehensive off their automobile policy. They want to add it back on now, fearful of you know trees or the water. Uh, it's usually about a 48-hour difference where we're just unable to make any changes at all. And that usually stays till about 24 hours after the occurrence has cleared the area where you'd be able to then make some changes. Now, Jackie and David are likely to be uh, called if you are not uh, explaining a policy properly or someone thinks that you're giving them the, not you specifically, but an agent is giving them the runaround or not handling something properly. Mm -hmm. um, at what point do you figure, with all of the calls that have come in, you need time to process however many or however few that you get? What's a reasonable time uh, for you to respond to someone and considering there's so many, what's the new window? I imagine it takes a little longer if you have plenty of calls. Yeah, the, well the insurance companies are going to be lenient. They always want you to take care of uh, emergency work first. You know, if there's a hole in your roof, get their hole covered. Um, if there's a tree down in your driveway, then go ahead get the you know get the tree out of the driveway. Uh, but other than that, if it's if it's something where an adjuster has contacted you, what's reasonable? Uh, I think within three to five days you should be contacted. Uh, as far as them coming out to see you, I think that is going to be based on the severity. That could be again a couple of days to maybe a week. Uh, as far as getting a claim paid. That's going to vary, but you're probably going to be looking to, some carriers may have the ability to pay a claim on the spot. Others would probably take up to, you know, three weeks or so in order to get a claim. And then it also depends on what the severity of the claim is, because if you have a mortgage and it's over a certain dollar amount, then the law requires that the insurance company puts the bank name on the check and now you get to send it to right. the bank to get it cashed and then back to you. So there are going to be some, again, some patients are going to be needed, but hopefully the companies are doing everything they can to. And to comment on that, I had a case today that um, was just a regular standard automobile accident claim. I was calling the adjuster to see if we're at a point where we could settle it. And his phone message, um, voice message was, that he's away on, on a desk assigned to handle claims from the hurricane and uh, that he wouldn't be able to respond to these things for at least a week or two, that he would be on that desk. So they seem to have created special teams almost to go in and start answering the phones for these claims. How do you handle clients who have questions about whether or not what an insurance person is telling them is on the mark, is correct, whether or not they're being misled, someone doesn't know? How do you? guide your clients through this if someone calls, whether they're businesses, perhaps where there's even more at stake for a homeowner. Well, first, you want to look at the policy. Exactly. Do you look at the policy? Yeah, I want, I sure. want to see the policy. I mean, it, it is very lengthy and wordy, and you have all these uh, additions later on after you buy but, it. There's always all these But things. insurance is a contract. Yeah, it's a contract. And to tell anybody what their contractual rights are, mm -hmm. they have to start with the contract. Is it reasonable that someone should have to call you to have an understanding of what their contract is, or is it something that they that really well, we should be in the insured? We would agents? generally be called if there's a problem trying to settle property damage, and mostly what we do is um, on the personal injury side, right. um, on personal injuries, uh, pain and suffering. But you know, we do handle some property damage claims. Is there ever an occasion Jeez. when you would work together? For example, let's, let me think of how about it's the tree, but the tree didn't fall on the house, or maybe it did, but it also fell on the past of the person who lived there too, and now there's not just that there's uh, an open roof, now there's someone who got conked on the head. 
Um, they may call you to fix the roof, but they may be calling the Jackie and David's yeah. of the world to back help. It's a personal injury it? claim. And, and, and so and how does that play then out? what we would do is we would take all the facts down like we would in any other case, an automobile accident or whatever it is, and determine where the liability falls because, as you had said, that most claims you need some negligence to yeah. pursue that. And homeowners policies will provide liability coverage if somebody was negligent. If it's an act of God, you may have a tough situation proving liability and maybe not have a claim, although many of these policies will have med pay and other types mm -hmm. of coverage that would provide some benefits to someone who was injured on someone's property. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Limit, limited, but... Very limited, but yeah. What's there? What suggestions do you have for people now that um, the storm is essentially over and they're doing the cleanup and whatever? What should they be looking at right now? Should they look at that... Uh, contract much more carefully or just pick up the phone and say time to review well uh, my first thing again to anybody that uh, hopefully uh, most people weren't affected and didn't have to put a claim in but if you did uh, again relax and, and hopefully you're getting some response but understand that you know there were an awful lot of claims that had to go in but now you can look at it and as I said earlier now's the time to say okay wh what had happened you know, I'd heard about hurricane deductible. Did I actually have one? And if you had one, do you understand it? And when would it come into play? Um, you know, did, did your neighbor get more coverage for food than you did? Did you get more coverage for a tree than your neighbor did? Uh, you're finding out that although homeowner policies are standard, there are a lot of companies that write policies and they offer different, some even unique coverages that um, you might you know, want to ask, hey, do I have this? Or if I don't, what would it cost if I got it? And um, explore things like that. A client had called me, and given the weather recently, we might hear more about this, but water in the basement where a sump pump failed. Mm -hmm. I, my understanding is that there are some policies where you can get a rider or some coverage. Because mm -hmm. in this last hurricane, again, if there had been more water than rain and the electricity went out and now the sump pump fails, um, it may not be. It may be covered if you have hurricane insurance or uh, flood insurance. But if you don't have flood insurance, this rider may provide some coverage. Isn't that correct? It's correct. Yeah, that's basically it could go by water backup, mm -hmm. and it's an endorsement that would give you. I've seen carriers give uh, generally twenty five hundred to five thousand dollars of coverage, subject to your policy deductible, and it's good to have even if you have flood insurance because sometimes water's in your basement and it wasn't because of a flood. Right. So the water backup is good. One of the uh, things that happens with the, all this uh, rain and such is that the sewers get overflowed and the sewers then bring the water back into your house. That is not a flood mm -hmm. and your water backup coverage would come into play there. Mm -hmm. Does everyone have water backup coverage? It's not. Uh, generally, no. That's not something that's on your policy. You have to ask for it and get it included. Reasonably, uh, why would anyone have to anticipate that. I wouldn't anticipate that. Of course, we don't really have, we live in situate. It's a different story. But is that something that I should have to think about? I can't imagine uh, every single contingency. I suppose that's your issue, yours and mm. others of like ilk. But um, when you are meeting with someone and having to determine what goes on, again, so that they don't end up with Jackie and David or someone of like ilk, how do you, do you end up going through all of these scenarios? Because I can't imagine how many more that there are that no homeowner could um, could possibly yeah, it's, it's it. hard to go over every single scenario but what we try to do in our office is give you a breakdown in the pricing of what the different things are and you make your choice do you want water backup if you would here's the price do you want earthquake coverage do you want flood coverage etc we just try to present the best options for the client and you know hopefully they're, they're taking the time to you know think about it and uh, you know, I know in today's economy, a lot of times the bottom line is just dollars, but it's mm -hmm. you will see in instances like this that you spend a couple of dollars, you get rewarded. Right. Well, I don't say rewarded, protected. but you get, you get protected uh, much better. I, I had another question. Do you deal with boat insurance? Sure. Yeah. All right. So in this last hurricane, do most policies require you to take your boat out of the water? And if so, do they also provide some coverage for that? Yeah, they can't require, well, I, I suppose, I, I don't know of policies that require you to take it out. I'm sure they'd like it if they could. Mo, uh, most policies are going to give you uh, some hauling coverage. 
fifty dollars, hundred dollars, kind of like a towing po a coverage right. on an automobile policy. Uh, your question, of course, is can can you know the harbor master get the boats out fast enough? Because mm -hmm. sometimes you don't have enough time, and depending when it's coming and such, it's, right. it's kind of difficult. That, that was sort of my concern because by the time boat? I do, <laughs> and I actually did um, have it taken out of the water. But there are a lot of people who couldn't make those arrangements in time to get it out, and mm -hmm. I was just wondering that they would also be covered if something had happened, even though they hadn't gotten it out of the water. Yeah, yeah, that, and a lot of people even made efforts and couldn't get it out. Right. Mm -hmm. called and told us. Are you folks finding that you need to uh, mediate uh, near fist fights uh, among mm -hmm. neighbors these days or in the past week or so since people have been so upset with what's going on, this tree or that car or whatever happened? I think what's happening mostly is people are confused and they're going back and looking at a policy for the first time. So they may come in and ask us, can you explain this to us? Um, what are our rights? You know, do I have a cause of action against my neighbor because something fell on my house that was in their yard? So there's mo more confusion than anything else. Um, we're not if, if there are if there are neighbors uh, fighting. I haven't seen it. No, I was going to say for That's the most part, I think people have been yeah. pretty good. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Considering there were several complaints that continue, um, you have many claims or issues to resolve. I'm sure that there's some sort of statute of limitations where if they haven't called you by now, maybe they moved out of town, I don't know what happened, but is there a, a window that people need to be aware of? If they haven't called you, they better? Yeah, I don't, uh, you mean to, to put a claim in? To put a claim in or ask you about whether or not something's covered, they don't know. If they have a well, you an have issue up about to a, last you have door. up to a year to put a claim in okay. for property, and you have up to three years to put a claim in for bodily injury. So you're going to have plenty of time, and I think that uh, based on the hurricane being last week, and then the rains and the winds that we're getting over the past couple of days, if you've had damage, I think you're going to find out that you've had damage um, by now. But you still don't have to rush to put it in, you know. And a lot of houses in Rhode Island are second homes. And people have already gone back to, you know, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, whatever. And uh, they weren't so easily able to get down to find out if there is damage. So that's why the state allows you uh, up to a year to put a claim in. Of course, you have those that won't put a claim in because they have such a, a high deductible. Mm -hmm. That's always yep. an issue. And I did come across a situation where uh, the, tree, the tree thing happened in one of my neighbors, but their deductible was $15,000. So it was just way... Not worth it to... No. Uh, that must have been one expensive tree if they were thinking that they were going to collect on. But yeah. I guess we should say it is important if you aren't calling in right away, that at least you should document. I mean, these folks are always saying make sure right. you pay attention and document every single thing that needs to happen. Oh, sure. I mean, you can always make the call, but uh, at that point, what are you going to say? I haven't seen my house yet. I might have a might have damage. Like, okay, we'll, and, we'll note the file. And while the law may allow it, mm -hmm. the faster you do put everything together and get the information to the insurance company, the quicker they can start working on your claim. So And get the repair done. Exactly. And, and you would be expected to at least start that if it would cause more damage. Um, you have to cooperate with your insurance company and, and protect and mitigate your damages. Well, we hope that this has been helpful to you. We hope that you've all weathered the recent storms safely. And if not, we hope that at least you are um, getting the help you need. Greg, David, Jackie, thank you so much for joining us. Stay tuned. Our discussion of legal matters continues. Join us.